Good Friday morning and welcome to Begin in the Word. In today's episode, we'll continue our study of the Acts sermons and conversions, and we're talking about the sermon and conversions on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Let's move to our review questions. Number one, what did Peter mean by pains of death? As he continued his preaching about Christ's death and crucifixion and resurrection there, he, he talked about Christ being loosed from the pains of death. Number two, how do we know that Psalm 16 was not about David? Psalm 16, as we'll learn, is a passage that Peter quoted in his discussion of Christ's resurrection. Number three, how do we know Psalm 16 was about a resurrection from the dead? And we'll uh, be discussing then those things and Peter's application of that passage as we continue in our study today. Let's go now to a portion of our text from Acts chapter 2, verse 23 through 24. Talking about Jesus, Peter said, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So here, Peter affirms that Christ was put to death, but that God raised him up and that when he raised him up, he loosed him from the pains of death. Well, some read that and question, does that mean that Christ was in some sort of pain uh, while his body was in the grave? Was, was he in some kind of torment, perhaps uh, for our sins or something of that effect? And that is not what this phrase in this text is indicating. When he talked about the pains of death, he used a, an idiomatic phrase, or a, a phrase that was symbolic, to put it in simpler terms. Uh, the language used is, is uh, often used with relationship to a woman giving birth pangs or, or uh, the pains that are associated with the birthing process. And so... Uh, Sometimes that phrase was used to indicate the idea of bondage or being bound, because certainly a woman who's in the midst of childbirth is bound to that occasion, or she's in the bondage of that moment and unable to be released from it until the birth is complete. And so you can see why the idea of birth pangs would, in their language, stand as an, in, an idiom for bondage. And this is how early Christians understood this phrase. For example, we can read uh, from Polycarp, who was a convert of the disciple uh, of the Apostle John. Uh, in early second century, Polycarp wrote an epistle to the Philippians. And in that epistle, he cited this passage. He said, whom God raised from the dead, from the dead having loosed the bands of the grave. So here, as uh, Polycarp talked about the, the citation of Acts 2 and 24, he cited it as Christ being loose from the bands of the grave. So there you have early Christians understanding those pains of death as indicating the bondage of the grave. And that's a bondage that Christ was able to break. It was not possible that the grave would hold the Son of God. And then in further evidence of this, Peter goes on to cite Psalm 16, which was a Psalm of David. He said in Acts 2, verse 25 through 28, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Now, as we read the Psalms of David, and in those songs he uses personal pronouns, it would be natural to assume that David is singing or talking about himself in, in those writings. And there are certainly instances where that is the case. However, there are times that David speaks in the person of the Son of God, that he's really not talking about himself. He's talking about Christ. 
Now, someone who is an opponent of Christianity would understandably say, no, this is David talking about himself. He said, I foresaw before my face and my heart rejoiced and my, my tongue. So this is uh, in, in that perspective, it would seem obvious that this is uh, David talking about himself. Well, let's investigate that. He said, my flesh, that's his body, would rest in hope. And that uh, rest there is not talking about taking a nap. It's talking about the grave because he said, you'll not leave my soul in Hades. That's the grave, uh, a corresponding Hebrew word that's used in Psalm 16. Those terms, uh, the Greek word Hades or the corresponding Hebrew term sometimes means grave. And then he gives in parallel structure, you won't allow your Holy One to see corruption. That's talking about the decay of the body or the flesh that happens in the grave. So we can see here that David has the tomb in mind and the sleep of death. Well, but is he talking about himself? Notice the very next passage, what Peter points out in Acts 2 and 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Well, he's talking about the tomb of David. He's talking about his grave. He's talking about his body, his flesh, that it is dead and buried. Peter is clearly indicating David does not fit the description of Acts chapter two, or, or excuse me, of Psalm 16. Psalm 16 talks about somebody who's, whose body was not going to stay in the grave, whose body was not going to decay. And clearly David's body had remained in the grave. So it couldn't be talking about David. The Apostle Paul later brought the same passage up, Psalm 16, in his preaching in Acts 13. Notice what he said about it in verse 36. For David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, that is the rest of death or the sleep of death. He fell asleep and was buried. That's the disposition of David's flesh in the grave. And what else did he say? He was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. Whereas the Psalms said you wouldn't allow the Holy One to see corruption, the Apostle Paul says David saw corruption. So Paul and Peter are making the same point here about uh, the citation of Psalm 16. David can't be talking about himself because David is talking about somebody who didn't stay in the grave and whose body didn't decay, but they vacated their grave. Notice the language, my flesh. You will not leave my soul in, in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. This, as we've said, is a quotation of Psalm 16, specifically verses 8 through 11. He talks about the body resting in hope. So we're talking about the body in the grave. And look at the parallel language here in the parallelism that's used in Psalm 16. You're not leave my soul in the grave and you'll not allow the Holy One to see corruption or to decay. So the my soul corresponds to the Holy One. The Holy One in Old Testament prophecy, that's very often the language of the Messiah. And the grave there, that's talking about the decaying of the body in the grave. So the parallel language clearly shows this is talking about the disposition of the body in the tomb. David remained in the grave and decayed, as we've heard Peter and Paul argue. Therefore, this psalm cannot be about David. Now, this is a powerful proof. From the perspective of someone who believes in the Old Testament, who believes in the Psalms, who believes that David is a prophet of God, and that perspective encompasses the Islamic faith and the Jewish faith of today, from that perspective, Psalm 16 foretells about someone not David, but someone else, the Holy One of God, not remaining bound by death, not staying in the tomb. It had to be Jesus. This has to be about the resurrection of Christ. No one in Peter's audience answered the connection to Psalm 16, nor do we have any other record from the first century century 
of where the opponents of Jesus took up Psalm 16 and said, no, that's not about the resurrection of Christ. The occasion there in Acts 2 would have been a great opportunity for an opponent of Christ to disprove that if they could have disproven it. Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 13 would be a great place for the opponents of Christ to make a strong argument that Psalm 16 is not about the resurrection of the Messiah from the grave. But they did not because they could not. No one produced the body of Jesus. The strength and power and growth of Christianity rested upon the truth of Christ's resurrection. In the beginnings of Christianity, it would have been a great opportunity for the enemies of Christ to step up and say, wait, no, he's not resurrected. Here's his lifeless body. It would have still been somewhat recognizable and they could have stopped Christianity in his tracks. But they did not because they could not. In fact, Matthew's record in Matthew 28, verse 11 through 15 shows where the opponents of Christ had to bribe soldiers just to claim that the body was stolen. But that story didn't take root and grow because if it did, it would have stopped Christianity in its tracks. People would have said, well, he's not raised. The disciples stole his body. But that story never got any traction because people knew it wasn't true. Their plan failed as Christianity continued to spread. You can see that in Acts 5 and 28, where it was turning the world upside down. There was no effective logical approach that disproved Christ's resurrection when the opponents of Christ wanted to disprove it the most. The Jews in the first century, the Roman government in the first century, both very powerful entities wanted to stop Christianity, but they did not because they could not because the resurrection of Christ is true, as is proven by Peter's sermon here on Pentecost. So what did Peter mean by the pains of death? That's an idiomatic phrase indicating the bondage of death. How do we know Psalm 16 was not about David? Because the passage foretells a resurrection, but David is still dead and still in his tomb. How do we know Psalm 16 was about a resurrection? Well, because of the language of his flesh having hope, not remaining in the grave and not decaying all points to uh, the resurrection of a body and the immortality of that body or not being able to decay. Thank you so much for joining us today in our study of the word of God. As you've begun today in the word of God, Hearing these evidences of the resurrection of Christ, why not live out today in that truth and in that knowledge? Be his faithful follower today, beginning in the word and every day in his word. Thank you and God bless.